you want to learn more about effective management, head over to madsingers.com and sign up for my free management training. Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Nick Jordan himself. Welcome to the show, Nick. Hey, Mads, thanks for having me. I'm really excited and a little bit nervous uh, to be here. You're a, you're a big deal in the SEO game. It's a, it's a scary place to be, scary place to be. Right, Nick. So this is not all about SEO, but also a lot about management. And uh, it's probably a little bit different for you to talk about because I know you are probably the only SEO in your business. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We just picked up a director of SEO, but that was true up until about three weeks ago. Excellent. Excellent. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and your background and so on? You know, um, I, I spent almost my entire career as like a sales product guy at early stage startups. And I, I knew I wanted to rescale into marketing because I feel like marketers just live much better lives than, than sales guys. And so I started that transition about three years ago. Um, and now I, I run a company called contentdistribution.com. We've taken four projects from zero organics to over 100,000 organics a month. Um, and we have a team of, of 25 people. That sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. And you, uh, you guys are mastering one of the things that very few SEOs are, which is the whole content game. Tell me yeah. a little bit more about that. I accidentally stumbled into SEO with this thing that works. Um, was, it actually wasn't the first time. I've, I've tried to get into SEO several times, but it didn't really stick until this, this most recent time. Um, and it's, it's worked ever since, and I just keep on figuring out how to make it repeatable, and, and it's very heavily content-focused. Um, you know, it's entirely content-focused. You know, our goal is to become the highest quality, most relevant page of content Google could show. And now we have over 65,000 page one keywords. I love it. I love it. And uh, I, I think it's very unusual for an SEO company. I mean, at least most of the clients that I've worked with in the SEO world have all been, you know, they're all good at backlinks and internal linking and, you know, all the, all the typical SEO stuff. But most people really struggle on the content side, at least until they get up to a certain level and can afford to really higher quality people, right? So how, how have you gone around that? Like, how have you managed to build a, a team of solid writers and so on? Yeah, so, you know, first off, like I just published a lot of content on my first project and it ended up working. And I just took, you know, those same concepts and been rolling them forward for the last three years. And, you know, I when I left the agency I was working for, um, I was freelancing. You know, I didn't really have a plan to build this this big agency. Um, and it just kind of happened organically. And I was working with a lot of freelance writers, some like from the Philippines who were like very cheap and not so, so great. Um, some pretty great freelancers, but that were more expensive. And I realized I was giving up, um, you know, one, actually the biggest reason is, is I wasn't reading the content I was posting to my client sites. And I knew I was going to shoot myself in the foot sooner rather than later. And I knew I had to, to, to solve that. Um, and so I, I had all these freelancers in my network and I asked my favorite one to be my editor and, and she said yes. And she's actually the one who's grown the team to, to 25 people in the last year. Excellent. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely inspiring. I know there's many people who would love to be in your shoes. So that's uh, definitely a good place to be. So Nick, you're, you're managing a, a you know, relatively it's, it's, big team. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, you're, you're managing a relatively big team. How has that come around for you? And, and how, do you, how do you find managing other people like that? I would say it's, it's um, you know, we were talking before the show about like relative happiness levels. And I would say my, you know, I have a relatively happy demeanor. But being responsible for 25 people is a lot of pressure. And it can create anxiety that I didn't used to have. Um, I personally feel like, uh, 
like it's too much responsibility and I've been able to kind of firewall myself off from the content production side of the business and have a very talented team of, of editors and, and operations managers that, that are able to manage, you know, 17 writers. Fantastic. Well, I can tell you when you start getting above a hundred, it doesn't get any less pressure. So. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm really good with like three or four direct reports and I'm very good at like building systems and like, um, you know, coaching, coaching my team. Um, and I'm, I'm very thankful for them because I don't think I, I feel like I'm not responsible enough or I'm too like flaky to be the, the go-to for everything everyone needs. Yeah. No, and, and the whole point is you're actually doing it right. So the, the thing is, as a CEO, as like as the guy making the right decisions and so on, right? You you shouldn't ideally manage more than four to five people. Um, and this is this is one of the specific things that keeps growth down for a lot of SEO, both companies and agencies and so on, right? Because when when you as a business owner try and run a business, grow a business, manage a business, and you try and and manage a plethora of people you know your time becomes very short very very quickly right yeah yeah and i I feel like it's it's like it's moving into that zone where it's like getting to be pretty different because you know i'm not doing the work you know the people that i'm managing aren't doing the work the people they're managing might be doing the work they're doing more work and like the end writers are like doing the bulk of the work and it's you know, and a lot of those people, maybe one or two levels past, I won't have met before. Um, and it's like, how do you, how do you create and inspire the next set of leaders? How do you like, you know, build this like internal candidate pipeline to bring people from like writing to like bigger positions in the organization? Um, and it's tough. I can't imagine, you know, 300 people. That sounds... Yeah, I, I think I think you. I mean, you're on the right track, right? Because you you're having the right thoughts. So again, the, the the key thing is, as a business owner, right? Maybe when you hire your first, and maybe also the second. But as soon as you start getting three, four, five plus people, right? Your focus should really be on them. And the problem, particularly, there's a particular problem in the SEO world is most people still spend majority of their time on SEO instead of on managing people. And if mm-hmm. you have a team of multiple people and you're not spending a significant period of your time managing, growing them, developing them, then you're really doing it wrong and you're ending up in the same situation as most SEOs are, which is basically a situation where you, 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 know, you, you won't be growing the business and you will be the bottleneck. You will be the reason why your business is not growing, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's when you, you make it sound very, very clear, like there's a very clear path on what you need to do. But I think one of the parts that a lot of consultants struggle with is like the cash flow portion. How do you, you know, charge enough and like like build this book of business that can support, you know, that eventual buildup of the team? And I think that's that's the tricky part to balance while you're on this path of delegating yourself out. Yeah, I, I agree on that. The, the, again, one of the reasons, I mean, we, we haven't spoken a ton before this, but one of the reasons why I yeah. think you're, you're very successful with this and have managed to get to as many people as you have is because you've, you've managed to niche down, right? The, the thing is, most people is like, oh, niche down. Yeah, I'm only doing SEO, right? But the problem with <clears throat> only doing SEO is you have like 8 billion different processes you're managing, yeah. right? And Absolutely like training someone or training even multiple people to manage them is very, very difficult, right? It's, it's like so hard. If, if you want to niche down, the, the way to niche down is niche down on a process level, right? And, and really that's a little bit what you've been doing with your content writing, right? Like you've really yeah. niched down and said, you know, we focus on content. Uh, I, I know a, a guy who literally just do audits, right? And if you only do audits all day, every day, that can be a great yeah. business, by the way. But if that's all you do, it makes it so much easier to train people, right? Like it makes it so yeah. much easier to, to build a framework, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that again, the, the whole point is where, where most SEOs really struggle is they don't understand. They, they think that 
offering more is more value, but that's not necessarily the case. The value is often like if you if you know a whole bunch of stuff, you value yourself here. But if you know something really well, you put yourself up on a pedestal, right? And you can charge significantly more money. And that's the typical problem because most SEOs is like, oh, you know, I'm charging 500 bucks per month or a thousand bucks per month. And I'm like, if you're ch charging a thousand bucks, how much do you spend to deliver? Oh, you know, six, seven, 800. Like, so you're making- and They know their numbers that well. Yeah. They're making 300 bucks a month for a client, yeah. right? And I'm like, and yeah. how much time are you spending to make 300 bucks? Like, and if you need, let's say you need to make three grand, right? Yeah. You need to have at least 10 of those clients just to pay your own bills, right? That's- It's tough. You know, I, like I, I, I've seen this frequently where, you know, those, those SEO agencies, they go build the 10 clients, they get the 3000 a month in profit. And then at some point they realize, hey, like this isn't actually the model that like is working and is going to take me to the financial goals that I want. And they have a very tough time blowing up the business, you know, dropping all their clients. They want to maintain their current head, you know, head count. They really like their team and they just kind of go on zombie mode where they have not enough profit margin to hire people, but too much work to like to, to relax. And it, it, most of most of the client I work with that do local SEO, majority of those become really successful in a short period of time for a very simple reason. They start charging a lot more money. Yeah. Here's the thing. If you, if you have a budget, let's say you can spend six, 700 bucks a month improving mm -hmm. someone's SEO. Like that sets limitations. Mm -hmm. now, if, if you, instead of 1K, if you charge people 5K <laughs> a month and you can, I mean, you're not going to spend 4K of that, but let's say for argument's sake, you go and spend 4K of that to deliver, right? You can afford to deliver a lot more quality, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think as SEOs, it's so important that any project you take on, we do a case study because case studies take six months, a year to develop. And when you're on those thousand month retainers, you know, the, the case study you develop isn't like is oppressive is if you're on a 5,000 month retainer and that can help you hop up to a 10,000 month retainer, you know, by crushing 5,000. But, but, but it's also just a mindset, right? Because again, so yeah. many people are sitting in these situations where they're like, Oh, you know, I used to charge thousand, maybe I should start charging 1500. Like so many clients that I've worked with have been so difficult for them to actually start charging like real money. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you do it, like it makes, uh, I mean, managing one client that pay you $5,000 a month versus managing five clients that pay you one <laughs> cage. No like, question. Like, yeah, it's a scary difference almost. Interesting. Yeah. Think, yeah you have to be very intentional. Yeah. So, but that's anyway, from, for me in, in terms of niching down and, and growth, right? The whole, the whole point is, don't try and master 17 different processes, right? And, and where so many SEOs really struggle, and, and this also happens in other businesses for sure, but it's, it's definitely prevalent in the SEO world, is, is really this thing where they're, they're just trying to manage too many things. It's so true. And, uh, and if, you cut, if, if you cut it down, and like you guys, for example, if you just focus on content, right? And, you know, your focus is just building one absolutely solid content process, then you can do that. You can learn it, you can master it. And you actually have the time, like a lot of SEO talk about a, a B split testing and optimization. Do you know how many do it? Like 0.01% of all SEOs, right? Cause they never yeah. have the time to do it. But the whole point yeah. is when you just focus on one process, you can mm -hmm. actually sit down, do some measuring, see what works better, all right? It's true, very true. Excellent. Well, Nick, you, you have obviously learned a, a lot of good management lessons, I take it, since you've gotten to where you are. So do you wanna share with the audience some of the sort of best tips and tricks you've learned so far? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's like two kinds. There's, you know, building a content team focus and there's just kind of like general yeah. stuff. Um, 
I'd say I'll start with the general management stuff is that, um, you know, you have to, you have to bring integrity every single day you show up. And the reason is, is because there's just so many challenges that you're going to run into again and again and again and again and again, that even if you don't bring your integrity 10% of the time, you know, in a six month period, in a year period, you're, you're not, you know, people won't think you have integrity. And so the only solution is just do it every single time, you know, be transparent over communicate in times of emergency. Um, and, you know, it's worked well for me. You know, I, I can't love that one. The stress that people create for themselves by not, you know, having integrity with every well, interaction. I, I, I see it all the time. And I, I, it's not that people don't want to have integrity, but, you know, I think it's often the type of personality that tend to do SEO, but very, mm -hmm. very frequently, if something screws up or whatever, they're hoping the client doesn't realize and they can then manage to fix it mm -hmm. without the client realizing because they're very afraid of saying, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Or they're very afraid of saying, I have this problem, right? But mm -hmm. definitely one of my early lessons in the corporate world was that the more you learn to apologize and saying, I screwed up, the more people trust you. Because just like with your staff, it's not the fact that people screw up. That happens. It's yep. that they don't tell you. And then suddenly you're supposed to deliver something and you can't. That's the issue, right? If they had told you two weeks earlier that they were way behind and you know they had a personal problem, you could put someone else on it or, you know, you could do a million things to fix the problem. The problem is when they wait until deadline day and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I only got half my stuff done. That's when you get a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it, it goes both ways. You know, I had a team member tell me on a one-on-one -on -one that like, you know, she didn't have a lot to do. She only worked for like half days because things were pretty easy at the current time. And I think, you know, she wouldn't have felt comfortable telling that to me unless, you know, she felt like, you know, I was a reasonable person and I treated her reasonably. And I appreciate her telling me like that's, you know, it's really vulnerable of her to say, yeah, everything's so easy. My life is great. Don't give me more work. That um, is good. It's good. And then, I mean, I have the same. I mean, I have, I have some of the guys that are literally knocking down my door and saying, you know, hey, I finished my work. I finished my work. Do you have anything else exciting I can do type thing? That's great. Right? And yeah. it, it, it's a pleasure when people do that. And it's, it, you, you really know you've gotten the right type of employees when you see that mm -hmm. happens consistently, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I would say another, another big thing that this is going to sound so like obvious to like someone from IBM, um, you know, and probably anyone who's like done this already, but, you know, I evaluate business risk a lot and, um, one of the ones that I didn't evaluate that kind of, you know, I, I crashed into was maternity leave. You know, 75% of my company is women. Um, for whatever reason, they seem to outperform their male counterparts. And um, it's not something I thought about in terms of like risk mitigation, you know, future planning, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I would say a good rule of thumb is like two of everything, you know, anything that two people can't do is like a risk to like non-continuation of, of that thing you need to do. Yeah. And, and this is one of the challenges people often have in a small business. Like if you have two or three or four staff, that's very difficult mm -hmm. to do. But one of the reasons why I really love growing business up pretty quickly initially, like I, I really like getting paid business up to these 15, 20 people is really so that you have this flexibility and you can have multiple people do the same things and so on. Right. Because it's definitely a weakness from a company when, when someone can just disappear. And, and I mean, you're saying maternity leave, that's one thing, but I mean, God forbid we can all get hit by Corona or we can get hit by a bus and, mm -hmm. um, Get a great luckily, offer, you know. luckily maternity leave isn't isn't permanent in most cases um but but you know you you have to have those contingencies in place and you have to think about them you you probably can't when you just have three or four people but when you start building a solid business and as you said when you're responsible for paying 15 20 people salary like you, you 
you need to have this stuff in order because else you end up potentially failing your business, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think another piece of advice and, and one of the reasons I've been able to grow so quickly is I, you know, I spent my own money on my own internal assets, marketing them. And what that meant is that I could do whatever I wanted within the budget that I had to accomplish an outcome, which was generate a lot of traffic. And the beautiful thing about this is you don't have to ask for permission or wait for a client to trust you with the budget necessary to create this. You can just go and do it on your own. And so when I started consulting, you know, I think most people have to ladder up, right? They get a bunch of smaller wins that escalate into bigger wins and then they get referrals. And in SEO, all of this takes a long time because graphs take a long time to produce. And, you know, when I started consulting, I had, you know, one project that was zero to hundred K and then I developed another project from zero to hundred K and that allowed me to start taking on more lucrative deals uh, sooner. And so one thing I always recommend to, you know, SEO agencies that are a couple of years behind me is, you know, invest in your own internal assets because those are case studies that make you so much money. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. <clears throat> totally agree. Um, and uh, I, th- I think, I think like, yeah, that, there's two key assets, right? So internal assets is one, but also your staff, right? I mean, your staff is also absolutely critical to invest in, but but I love it from a mm-hmm. like case studies. And, and again, the more you need down, the easier it is, right? Because you really want yeah. a, a case it study is. that really hits your client. Like if your client is affiliate SEOs, you want to have, a case study that hit affiliate SEOs. If you have five mm-hmm. types of clients, you need five types of case studies. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'd say my last piece of advice is, you know, around specifically around building a content team. You know, what I did was I grabbed my best writer, turned her into an editor. And then I spent like six months documenting everything that was in my head. Um, I took on a couple clients and I didn't really scale uh, and so I knew that I had a repeatable process that someone else could implement, um, you know, and then, and then she got too busy to be an editor. And so she pulled in one of her other writers and now that person was editor and she stepped into content management role. And then I stepped into more operations role. And so every time we needed to like, you know, I needed to focus on high level things. I'd have to bring her up behind me and then she'd have to bring someone up behind her and we kind of ladder up in responsibility um, together. And, and that, I mean, that's the way I love doing it, right? I, I see so many people that always try and recruit from the outside, but the challenge is first and foremost, one, you actually end up paying a lot more for the skill, yeah. right? Yeah. And two, the challenge is when you hire up within your organization rather than at the bottom, the risk that poses to the organization, <laughs> if it's a bad hire, is significantly higher, right? Much higher. And, uh, and the, the benefit is when you're promoting people from within, you know what you're getting, right? Might not be the best person in the world, but, you know, if it's a great person that's working on developing and, you know, they're growing, like, that's what you want, right? And yeah. yeah. You know, the external hire is going to take two to six months to figure out if they're crushing it or not. And, you know, if they don't, that sets you back like a really long time. Six months is a long, long time to not have a key you know, role that you were hiring for, um, uh, you know, you can just evaluate people. Is this person responsible? Can they handle more? You know, do they want to level up? Uh, it's just a lot better. And then also, I think part of the thing of maintaining and retaining high performers is you have to have a career directory for them. You know, the best team members are going to be the most ambitious and they'll have the most job offers. And if you can't provide them an upward path, then they're going to get bored and they're going to take their, their excellent attitude, you know, somewhere else. And, and the key thing for me is it's, it, I, I totally agree with you, but I think most of the time people's like, oh, I can't afford to promote this person and so on. But, mm-hmm. but it's not about promotion. It's really about keep giving people responsibility, right? Because Absolutely. like if you take yourself or a, anyone on this call listening, right? If you're working in a day job in some business, right? The one thing most people want, and if you're an entrepreneur, you, you definitely want it as well, but it's responsibility, Right. If 
And, and I always use the same examples because people think that it, that's how I think, but no one else thinks like that, but most people do, right? So if your boss, if you have worked in a day job at some point in your life and your boss comes to you and say, hey, you know, I'm working on this project, but I'm super busy. Would you mind helping me with it? You know, even without knowing what that project is, 99% of the time, people would say, hell yeah, right? Because yeah. it sounds yeah. exciting. It sounds like responsibility. It's like, I can do some of the stuff my cool boss does and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how you have to think. Like very often I see business owners and they're like, oh yeah, but this stuff I'm doing is so boring. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. To you it's boring because you've done it every day for 500 years. But the people who have never done it, who have never seen it before, mm -hmm. that's a new thing. It's interesting. And if you pick the right people, they will likely also enjoy doing it. All right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, believe it or not, there's actually people around the world that enjoy filing their taxes every <laughs> year. Like, imagine people enjoying that. But there is. Right? So that there's people who enjoy doing the most obscure things. And... You know, if you find the right people for the right roles, you, you can really do that, right? And, and when you learn to let go of the stuff that you have, one, either not good at, mm -hmm. or two, mm -hmm. the stuff that just takes a lot of your time, it frees up so much mental capacity either way, right? It really does. Yeah, it really does. Um, I, tell my team all the I tell my team all the time, you're in a unique position because you can change how you do work. You know, a lot of people, they can't change how work comes to them or how work leaves them. And it can be very stressful and it can create a lot of anxiety. I was in a position, I couldn't change how work came to me. It created a lot of stress for me. I tried to change it for six months and so I resigned. And I tell them all the time, listen, if you don't like, you know, how work is given to you or, or how you do work, you know, go ahead and change it because I'm not the best person to, you know, make that decision for you. You are or your manager is. So, you know, you want to expect, you want to expect people to make constant progress when you're not looking. And, and the, the way I try to do that, I mean, I always tell people and say fundamentally in my companies, most people can decide their own salaries. The way they decide it is based on their impact on the company's performance, right? As I always say, if someone helps me make a hundred K, I'll happily give them 10, right? Um, <laughs> And, and the, the problem is it's not a normal employee mindset, but that's the way you want people to think, right? You want people to think not just, oh, I've been here eight hours every day and I'm never late, you know, give me more money. It's, you know, when I impact the business enough, when I help the company achieve certain results, then I'm more valuable and therefore I get paid more, right? I think it's especially important in a, in a service business too you know, yeah. where talent is everything. And the, you know, I think it's super important yeah. to retain. Um, and then, you know, I'd say one last thing is uh, like, I think scaling to the, you know, we've gone from like 20 pages a month of content we're publishing to 500 pages a month of content we're publishing. And we've been able to do it without creating a lot of stress and anxiety for everyone or uh, increasing our like error rate in grammar and spelling issues and et cetera. And so there's a couple key tips that have worked really well for me is one recruit in Eastern Europe. Serbia has worked great for me, very educated people, low amount of internal opportunities within the country. Um, most of my team has, you know, has master's degrees. In. Um, second is, you know, when you're searching for writers, the, the broader your search, um, the more easily you're going to be able to find like the needle in the haystack or the most affordable, highest quality writer. So, you know, we have 25 today, but we started off with a thousand and we sent like 200, you know, tests and like a hundred video interviews and like 75 tasks and like 50, 50 dropped out. You know, churn is, especially in, in, you know, teams like content teams, churn is going to happen. And yeah. You, know, you need to build processes, not from just like an implementation for a client perspective, but you need to build like on hiring, onboarding and training processes too. You know, I think like we went from a thousand people to 25. So it's not that like we're particularly good at identifying talent. We just have systems that put large numbers of people and allows us to surface the people that are good. 
and and that's that's the key thing right so so uh, i mean i i talk a lot about this but having good recruitment systems is definitely one thing now the, the benefit with also having a na- relatively narrow process as you guys have is that it requires less training right yeah if, if you imagine a company trying to do the full seo suite of what comes with seo you know the amount of training documents and processes that needs to be up to date is humongous right so so being able to focus on for example content writing and i mean it's still a lot of work to do but it's significantly less than if you're yeah you know automate as much of it as you can like you know we have zapier where you know when we flip the status in Airtable, an email gets triggered to the person with a link to a google doc with their test um you know we're just able to do a lot with a little staff uh, by investing We've hired external consultants for Airtable and Zapier just to make it even more robust than we could do ourselves. And I think systems are the reason, you know, everything you preach, systems, culture, training. And I I love you say that because it's also one of my favorite tricks, right? I see so many entrepreneurs sitting around trying to learn everything and master everything themselves. And it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're not good at Airtable or if you're not an Excel wizard, you know, go to Upwork or, you know, phone yeah. a friend and like hire, like even if you pay someone a couple of hundred bucks, right? Like if they do some kind of automation that saves you hours a day or hours a week, even, you know, it's going to be a good saving over time. Right. And it's going to be a lot exactly. less stressful. And I, and I look at it in one additional way, you know, anytime I can eliminate like a manual tedious task. So even if it costs me like more than I've saved, I'll still do it because then I don't have to think about managing that VA that was doing it. I don't have to worry about them being sick or not doing it right. And error margin and yeah, it's just gone for my like you know Zapier who takes care of it now. Yeah. It'll take me five years to recruit, and it's totally worth it for the mental bandwidth. Fantastic. What's the biggest management screw up you have ever made, Nick? I mean, there's there's so many. It's hard to pick. Uh, just one. Fortunately, you know, like I'm the least fireable person in the organization. And so uh, <laughs> I have a little bit more leeway than, than maybe other people, you know, I'd love to hear yours, you know, make me feel comfortable sharing my biggest vulnerability by telling me yes. Yeah. Uh, well, again, like you, I have millions, but uh, I think one of the biggest ones were when I first started out the outsourcing company, um, I, I got blinded by a resume as i always tell people never to do but i I was uh, i was interviewing this guy who had 20 years worth of sales experience and Mm -hmm. you know i was so blessed that he wanted to talk with someone who was just starting a business and you know life was great and i hired him and yeah i I had basically hired him because i saw his cv and fallen in love with with the profile and what i hadn't realized was he had worked in sales for 20 years in the same business, very likely because he couldn't find another job. Um, He absolutely sucked at sale. He was probably even less assertive than me. He was more uncomfortable with people than I am. And yeah, so that was one of those people. and, And it obviously took me way too long to realize that and admit my own mistake. So that uh, ended up costing me a fair bit of time and money. Um, and that was definitely not a wise choice. Um, so, yeah. Well, That's one of know, if it wasn't ending up on like the front page of TMZ or, you know, SEOnews.com, I think you're doing pretty good. You know, hiring a bad, everybody hires a bad person. Yeah, but um, when it's the second person you hire, it's, it's, it's difficult. It is for sure. Um, I like, I'm struggling to think of like a specific example, but I'd say mindset is probably my biggest one. You know, recently I've, I've come to take responsibility for all the outcomes that happen, you know, throughout my business. And it's really empowering because it means I have the potential to change that outcome uh, in the future. And, and previously, you know, when I would, when I would blame other people, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, we've been turning out a lot of writers, you know, is it the fault of, is it the fault of the interviewer for letting those bad writers in? Is it the fault of the trainer, you know, who should have trained them 
to be productive and they turned out anyways. You know, it was even the fault of my director of operations who was responsible for, for hiring. And the answer is it was my fault. You know, I didn't put enough emphasis on my director of operations that, hey, like, I want you to spend X hours per week recruiting. You know, I want this many viable candidates. I want you to report to me this every Monday. You know, we identified 10 things that we can do to reduce churn. And, you know, none of those people who were, who were working on the situation were at fault. It was, it was me for not prioritizing it in the organization. So what, one of my... One of my absolute favorites with when you start getting into larger scale and, and s small processes mm -hmm. is looking at history. So I love looking at data and we, we constantly, we basically ask all candidates the same questions, mm -hmm. which means we can go in and compare. So if yeah. you go back and look at your company and look at your top 20% of performers, Mm -hmm. and look at what did they all have in common in the interview yep. question. And then you go and look at, then you go and look at the people you hired that did not work out and look at what did they have in common in the interview questions. And you can, you can compare many other things. You can also compare like resume and experience and what level of education they had or, you know, what type of education they had or how much experience they had writing before joining you. And like, you can, you can look at all these things and they will very, very frequently when you start doing that, when you've been hiring at the scale you have, you will start realizing things that, you know, doesn't necessarily make any logical sense, but you're like somehow 20, our top 20% all, comes from this particular education or you know <laughs> top 20 percent all lived abroad in a foreign country or like there's all these weird uh there things is. that you can mix up and that will help your recruitment process immensely um so we we hire a lot in the philippines where i have a an outsourcing company and one yeah. of the one of the, the biggest differentiators is if people have lived abroad for more than three months they, they go straight to interview because when we look at nine of our top 10 people, they've all lived abroad, right? That's really powerful. You know, we're, we're doing that on the, the like post hiring side, right? Our, our demographic is master's degree in English. Uh, they did their thesis on some obscure part of English and then they teach English now. And like those three just like crush it for us. Um, but we, we haven't, we haven't, Taken it to the level that you have and done it that on the front side of the interview. So we definitely did. I mean, we one one of the things we found was also around honesty. So I throughout the interview, I usually ask at least a couple of questions. So, for example, questions that are you know you can answer either or, but and it doesn't. It's not game changing, but it's more about honesty. So for example, if you have to pick one or the other, do you prefer working by yourself or as part of a team? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing, 80 some percent of candidates will say, well, you know, I can do both. I'm really good at this and I'm really good at this. But if I have to pick one, it'll probably be this one. Uh -huh. The best people we have hired, when we look at nine of our top 10 people, they mm -hmm. all said, I work better alone because blah, 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 blah. So they were, they were not trying to give the interview answer. They were being honest and direct. And that worked. Now that worked for us. That might not work for you or someone else. But by looking at the data, you start realizing those things. You start looking at what are the answers that are in common. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We we track all our stuff in Airtable and like we can see like hiring source, but we're we're not tracking the interview questions and the exact answers. So we definitely need that. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a lot to iterate on you know, on our side. Definitely. And then the, the bigger scale you do is the more fun it becomes, right? So explain, expand on that. Yeah. So the more data you have, right? Like yeah. the more interviews you do and whatsoever, the more high yeah. issue, the more data you have, the better decisions you can make, right? Just like SEO. <laughs> like if you only have a couple of pieces of data, it's whatever, but you know, the more data you have, the better your recruitment becomes if you actually structure the data in a way so you can actually analyze it, all right? 
And what, what we often try to do, so we, we have a couple of, of amazing HR ladies and, you know, we track all our resumes in, in uh, yeah, like Google Sheets or Airtables or whatever as well. And we basically try and put down, like basically have columns for different things, like, you know, what's the city they were born in or what's the city they live in. And, you know, basically trying to break yeah. down every resume as much as we can so that it becomes comparable, right? Um, yeah. yeah, we started um, We started using Facebook for our recruitment mm -hmm. funnel. We're now using Facebook ads to, to find writers because we feel like we tapped out the job sites of active, active lookers. And, and now we're starting to track things like our cost for qualified candidate and our cost for hire and you know what our attrition rate is and then that like multiplies our cost for hire by whatever that is. And, you know, we're getting pretty sophisticated. It's a lot of fun. You're right. It is a lot of it's, fun digging in the numbers. Now, I mean, my, my, everything else being equal, my, my favorite hiring platform is LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And you've probably heard me say this before, but the best people are rarely unemployed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And the problem is every time you look at job sites or something, and that's, I mean, that's probably good because sometimes you get in front of people who already have work, right? But most of the time when you look at job sites, most applicants are unemployed. Mm -hmm. And just like most guys probably listening to this podcast, you know, if you really, really wanted a job, you could find one. Mm -hmm. If I really, really wanted a job on any country in this planet, I could find a job. Uh, by the way, I have no education, so that wouldn't get me anywhere. But um, I could find a job, right? And and the philosophy is always that the best people, like your absolutely top A players, always have the capacity to go find a job, right? And and the, the beautiful thing with LinkedIn is you can find people who already have work, right? So. How do you deal with giving them false hope, you know, and then like, you don't you know, before you really find out anything about them right so, so, how, do you, so how do you approach them so here here's the very simple trick so you approach them and say hey nick i can see you work as a writer we currently have this job opening available would you happen to know anyone that would be a good fit for it so you're not approaching them directly so here's what happens so about 40 percent of the candidates we hire from linkedin is actually referrals from people we message. So we both get referrals oh. from people who have friends. Because the thing is, if you're a writer, everything else being equal, you're more likely to know other writers. Yeah. Right? So we get a you whole bunch of friends. Exactly. So we, we get a whole bunch of referrals, but also many people actually turning around saying, hey, yeah, well, maybe me. You know, and here's the difference. So we, in the beginning, we failed big time because we would go to people and say, hey, Nick, I can see you're a writer, you know, how much are you charging? Or, you know, would you be interested in a different job? And yeah. it literally, 0 0.5 seconds, the conversation goes to salary and you're kind of negotiating salary with someone before you even interview them or figure out if they're good enough, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And point. don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. But the, the other message here just... It gets them to the job. Type. They can see the job. And, you know, if they're interested, they would typically say, or even they'll just go and apply, right? But that's, yeah, that's how we do it. And that, that works really, really well. You know, it's, it's so funny that it's, you know, hearing you say both, it's just a simple tweak, but it took years of experience to understand the tweak yeah. and to come up with it. Definitely. So I guess that's, that's, you know, probably why people hire you is because, you know, they don't have to flounder around DMing people, you know, asking that's if they a lot can of hire it. them. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, but yeah, that's good. That's good. Any other amazing tips on anything management or the likes, Nick, before we finish off? Um, you know, probably a bunch of great things right after we hang up. But, you know, I'd like to hear from you, you know, we talked about our worst, you know, management losses. What's your, what's your biggest management W? At building teams. I mean, for me, for me I, I am a big, big, big fan, as most of my listeners know, of DISC framework. Yeah. And being as good at DISC as I am, 
really, really makes me able to read people amazingly well. And it really makes me able to put the right people in the right seats. Now, I am not successful every time because you were dealing with human beings, but but the skills that I have in that regard is definitely one that enables me to build amazing teams. And I mean, my outsourcing business, um, probably for the longest time, two out of three of my managers were basically started with me when they were 18 and 19, had no education. Uh, they, they were great people, but, you know, again, I found them not because I'm great at looking at resumes, but because I'm great at picking the right people. Um, and, that's, I mean, building great companies requires great people. And, and that's, I don't think there's any skill more important. And I think I am very, very good at sort of building the right team, putting the right teams together. So, What's the biggest team you ever built, you know, from the ground up? Uh, so the teams? outsourcing company I have right now, uh, basically we started with zero. So that's about four, I don't even remember, four or five years ago or something. Yeah. Uh, it took us about, two and a half, three years to get to about a hundred people. Wow. And after that, I didn't, I mean, I, um, since that, since we got to around a hundred people, I basically had a, had a couple of managers who manages the whole thing. And I basically spent two hours every week on, on managing the company. So that's incredible. You know, that's, that's what I'm looking at. You know, if I want to quadruple my income, I need to quadruple my team size. And, you know, I'm wondering like, how do I go from 25 to what changes between 25 and hundred? Right. So that, that's three steps, right? So that's, that's three steps in building up a company. The, the first step is basically getting about the sort of five to eight people. And that's mm -hmm. getting out, away from the spider effect. Right. And that's basically mm -hmm. the step where you, where you learn to delegate and you, you learn to push mm -hmm. down. The second step is technically typically around 20 to 25 people. Mm -hmm. And that's when the manager, the business owner really have to learn to start working through other people. Mm -hmm. right? That can be really, for some people, delegating can be okay. But when they then have mm -hmm. to, you know, trusting other people to deliver the work, that can be really difficult. And that's yep. typically around 20 to 25. And then the third step is around 50 staff. And that's mm -hmm. basically when the business owner gets so far detached from the new staff coming in that you know the the vision the communication doesn't reach from the top of the organization to the bottom of the organization and mm -hmm. when that's the case when organizations when communication isn't happening within the organization so people don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it and you mm -hmm. know the strategy mm -hmm. and the vision for the company doesn't get from the top to the bottom then that that's often a big big inhibitor right so that that's typically three steps yeah, I, I, you know, I can see that matching kind of my own journey. Um, it does feel like I'm around stage two, and I think, you know, I am struggling with stage three. So, so a couple of things in stage two, right? And and this is you, you as a business owner, you are you're learning a lot, and you're you're obviously developing your staff, right? Mm -hmm. The key thing is teaching your staff both to consistently become better is critical, but also to train their replacements, as you said earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, there's a lot in this. Like mm -hmm. if you want to train really good managers, you have to teach them to recruit. You have to teach mm -hmm. them to find great people. You have mm -hmm. to teach them to manage those people really well. Mm -hmm. And again, this is what I see. This is where I see the biggest breakdown in most organizations because the amount of management training managers get is in majority of cases non-existing. Now, someone, someone will, 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 will take someone and promote them from editor to content manager and they'll go and buy them like 10 courses in content management, but not a single course in people management, not a single training in people management. You're so, you're so right. You're absolutely right. There's and, very little. I've done very little. And that's the thing, right? <laughs> the, the thing is, when you promote a manager, the way you make them good managers, da -da -da, is help them learn, right? 
And in most companies, this does not happen. And that is often where people get stuck on the second step because they're not growing through it. Um, I, I, I work quite close with uh, Kurt Phillip when he was building up a Convertica. And I started working with him when he had about five staff members or so. And they have literally shot, like, I think they're about 30, 30 some now. And mm -hmm. they've literally just went right through it. Because the first thing we did when he had these five staff members in the beginning, four of those people as uh, high level managers managing the mm -hmm. business today, mm -hmm. right? Because wow. at the point in time when they only had five people, he took the time and he invested in developing their management skills. Yep. And basically what that meant was they didn't hit that blockage, right? Like when they got to 15 people, when they got to 20 people, when they got to 25, there was absolutely nothing stopping them because the managers had the management skill sets to grow the company. Very interesting. One, one resource that I've leveraged heavily is, um, are you familiar with GitLab? Yep. So the, for those of you who don't know, they're the largest remote company in the world. So 1,300 employees are publicly traded and they have the, the GitLab handbook. And it's like, like, I love it because it feels like an open source, like communication framework for remote teams. And I've never seen anything like it before. And, you know, I think I'm pretty sure you could just take and make it, a, you know, make it work for your company. And that's what we've done, you know, around one-on-ones and like, you know, like, like manager of one and, and those kind of things. But we definitely haven't put enough emphasis on like, you know, more formal training besides here's some resources. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I mean, Basecamp, I, I don't like the tool particularly, but uh, they also have some really, really solid content on management and so on. Um, but yeah, I mean, ov obviously I'm, I'm biased, but I, I tell any business, right? Like when you start, when you promote someone into a management position, invest in them, give them the training. It will... It'll, it'll pay back so many fold, right? Because it, the, the problem is most people will even tell you, like you will have staff members saying, oh, but I don't like managing people. Or, or like a lot of SEOs says, I don't like managing people. Yeah. And the reason they don't is because they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The thing is when you don't have any knowledge, like even when you, when you didn't know what SEO was, when you first started looking at SEO, it looked like this giant scary thing. You're like, yeah, oh, that's very scary. And that's how most people look at management. But the thing is, like my course, for example, you're literally talking five hours, right? Like that's not, that doesn't necessarily include implementation, but you, you basically learn a lot of stuff in five hours that will make you a 80% better manager, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't take forever, but most of it is understanding the change in mindset between being an individual contributor and it all being mm -hmm. about you and what you do to yep. not being about you and being about a business, being about your employees, right? Like that, that mindset change is so, so critical. Um, but, but yeah, and, and when people start to get all this basic management, right? It also becomes so much easier because they start liking it. They start, uh, I mean, Matt Diggity, for example, is a good example. When I started yeah. working with him years ago, you know, he did not like managing people. And the thing was, he didn't know what he was doing. He definitely wasn't doing it particularly amazingly, uh, like most other people, right? And, and who can expect, like the whole thing is when you haven't learned, you don't know. But what happened was, again, he got the training, his team got the training, and you know now they enjoy it. Now they love it. They love developing people. You know, management's tricky because I feel like there's not a clear path forward. Like I have a very clear path to deliver like an SEO outcome. But with, you know, especially new managers, you know, how do you get the outcome that you're looking for from a person that isn't you? And like, how do you like align the input just right to get them to like do the thing that you want them to do? And I think that's very non-intuitive. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of people don't like it. Or at least one, one of the reasons, but it's also that, that most people's mind is on, like, for example, if someone works in customer service and then you promote them to customer service manager, you still feel like they should be the expert on, which is why you then buy them more customer service courses, right? But the whole thing is they shouldn't. Actually, let me turn that around. The 
problem is if they are, right? Mm -hmm. The whole point is when you put someone into a management position, if they are always the expert, that is going to hinder their development. Because what you want to do is you constantly want the people below to develop, right? So, and, and it, it's kind of this, it's chicken and egg thing sometimes, but it's not. But a lot of time people's like, oh, but I have this guy. He's so good at whatever. You know, I don't want him to train someone else. I want him doing it. But the whole point is if he's doing it, someone else is not learning it. And the point is yeah. he's so good at this thing but he could be so much better at doing more valuable work, mm -hmm. right? Like if he's learned to become super good <coughs> at something that's valuable, he can become even better at stuff that's more valuable and you can develop more people like him, yeah. right? And that's the, that's the mindset change. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's great. I'm going to have to follow up with you after this about the, the course. <laughs> Excellent. Right, Nick, it has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. And I'm sure the audience have had a good time as well. All the, all the golden nuggets you're dripping. So thank you very much. Mads, thank you so much. Uh, what a great way to kick off the week. Um, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Ken. Excellent. If people want to get hold of you, Nick, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, LinkedIn, Nick from Seattle. Facebook.com slash Nick from Seattle, Instagram.com slash Nick from Seattle, uh, or my website, contentdistribution.com. So I have a great question. Are you from Seattle by any chance? I, I happen to be from <laughs> Seattle. It's crazy. Fantastic. Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Nick. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.